Hey everybody, this is Dan and this is a video for Module 4. And in Module 4 we're going to talk about agriculture. So we're, again, we're going back to the early 1800s. And, and there's a couple of reasons we have to talk about agriculture. First of all, in the early 1800s, again, if we're looking at the history of business and technology for that matter, agriculture was the big business in the U.S. as it is today. But, but prior to the 1860s and 1870s, it was the largest segment of business in the country. So agriculture is really important and it's especially important uh, from a historical standpoint because it represented uh, most of the gross national product prior to the 1860s and 1870s. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. It's not gonna be a long lecture. So again, we have uh, two readings. We have a chapter out of a textbook and then we have an article that came from a database online uh, came out of JSTOR and both of those are available to you as PDFs on the website. So um, the first article, the, the one that came out of a book, is going to talk about various innovations of technology that allowed agriculture to expand. Now before we get into that, one of the core um, arguments I guess I want to make or facts I guess I want to make and as, as someone who I grew up on a farm so I'm kind of a rarity but um, when you look at the history of farming and the history of industrial capitalism and industrialization in the United States the first thing you have to understand that an industrial revolution is not possible without an agricultural revolution and the reason I say that uh, most of you are familiar enough with the history of the country to know that you know the big cities the big cities like Cleveland and Pittsburgh and New York and Buffalo the big cities of the East Philadelphia uh, Atlanta uh, all of those cities you know build up in the early 1800s and in the later 1800s and and the one thing that you need to have population in cities is you need some way to feed them so you need agriculture to ramp up as well because all of a sudden your ratio of farmers to non-farmers changes if there's a lot more non-farmers than there are farmers someone has to feed all those people so there has to be an agricultural revolution in order for an industrial revolution to take place now the the arable land the the uh, acreage of land that you could grow things on certainly expanded in the country but also what happened is because of machine tools farmers could produce uh, more bushels of grain for example per acre of land and that's all because of machines so you know the two big machines and you'll read about these the two big machines are the first mechanized or technologically advanced farm uh, f pieces of farm equipment. One of them was the reaper, which was invented by Cyrus McCormick, and the other was the steel plow, which was really perfected by John Deere. So you've heard of the brand John Deere. You see it all the time today, whether you're looking at road construction or whether you are familiar with farms. And John Deere started you know, way back in the early 1800s. It's one of the oldest continuous con uh, companies in the country. So what Cyrus McCormick did First of all, he invented, he invented the reaper, and the reaper was a machine that would cut wheat automatically. So if you're a farmer like I am, or you came from a farm, uh, think about a combine. It's similar to a modern combine, only it, was, uh, it, it just basically cut wheat and helped harvest it. There was still a lot of manual labor involved. But McCormick is interesting because in some ways he was like the Steve Jobs of his day. He was a real marketer, so you know he... Um, uh, created a business to build the Reaper, he got some patents on the Reaper, and then he would take it out and sell it and market it. So he would put Reapers on railroad cars, cars and you know they would go out and do demos in fields all over the Midwest, all over the country, including here in Ohio. So it's, it's interesting that McCormick's Reaper, uh, it allowed farmers to harvest more grain faster, so therefore the productivity or the um, uh, yield of grain per acre increases over time. So that's McCormick. You'll read a little bit about him. That's a real important development in technology in this country because if you can't feed people, you're not going to have an industrial revolution. You're not going to change into an urban society as we have. Uh, the other thing is John Deere. And John Deere invented the first steel plow, although you will read about other people that invented plows uh, in the reading. And you'll read about John Deere also. The, the big thing about John Deere, there's two developments. The moldboard of a plow, that's a, a curved piece of steel that allows the soil to be turned over because when you're plowing, you're turning over ground. 
uh, he made his mold board out of steel and that was significant for two reasons. First of all, it was durable. It didn't wear out. Uh, cast iron wore out, got rusty over time. But second of all, steel is smoother. So it would allow dirt to be turned over easier. So again, you could plow more acreage in a given period of time with a steel plow than you could with a wooden plow or even a cast iron plow. So that's one of the things John Deere did was this steel plow was revolutionary at the time. The other thing he did that's really interesting was John Deere built a standardized plow. So Prior to John Deere, if a farmer wanted to plow, he might have to go to a hardware or an implement dealer at the time and order one, and then the plow would be made for that farmer, so there was a waiting period. One of the things that John Deere did was he made a lot of plows, he standardized them, so when a farmer wanted to plow, they could simply order one from John Deere and they could have it, you know, cash and carry. They could take it right then. So John Deere was sort of the beginning of this just-in-time manufacturing, if you will, or at least uh, something that we know as consumers today that, you know, if you want a car, you can go to the dealership and you can basically drive the car home. So this idea that the plow was ready. So that's the thing about John Deere you should understand, and that's the gist of the first reading. The second reading, most of you probably aren't going to like, so if you read it and you like it, then you know you're either a historian or a scholar because it's a little weird and it talks about um, how other historians have perceived the Industrial Revolution. So it talks about Marxism and it talks about capitalism and the mechanization of farming, what that all meant from an economic standpoint. So some of you might not like the article, you might not get it, just go ahead and try to slog through it the best you can. Uh, but if you're into that article, that means that you're really getting it. You're really interested in these economic systems and how these developments in technology are interpreted by other historians. So that's sort of the gist of the article. The thing is that the article talks about the family farm, and I grew up on a family farm, maybe some of you did, but the family farm became part of a capitalist system. That's one of the arguments in the article because manufacturers would all of a sudden sell farmers uh, reapers and plows, for example, and then farmers would sell their harvest to other capitalists such as grain mills, which would process their grain, uh, sell it as flour, that sort of thing. So the argument there is that as farms mechanized, farmers became part of this big capitalist system because they no longer controlled the means of production. And if you remember back to our capitalist conversation or capitalism conversation a few weeks ago, one of the uh, one of the hallmarks of capitalism is this idea that uh, the workers do not necessarily own the means of production. So, in this second article, the historian argues, or there's an argument or a debate between historical views that mechanization of farming led to the um, uh, led to capitalism and uh, family farmers all of a sudden weren't in control of their own destiny. So in a Marxist system where the workers control things, um, you know, they don't need people to process their food, they don't need uh, production tools. But in a capitalist system where the means of production is owned by someone other than the worker, uh, you can see how this interpretation comes in that the mechanization of farming turned farming into capitalist enterprises. So, you know, read it, take, take out of it whatever you can. I'm sure some of you will find it interesting. I actually like articles like that, but I'm kind of a history nerd, so just excuse me. Um, but, it, but it's an interesting read. And, and so also, one of the things to take away from that is understand what subsistence farming is. Uh, there's not too much of that around anymore, but subsist subsistence farming is farmers that grew everything they needed. In other words, they grew all of their own food and anything they had left over they would sell as a profit. Now, I grew up on a dairy farm in Lorain County, Ohio, and we were not subsistence farmers. We were a dairy farm, so we raised grain, uh, we grew hay, fed our own cattle, and then we sold our milk, but you know everything else we bought. So we bought tractors and we bought implements and we bought our own food because we didn't, you know, we didn't raise enough food or have a big enough garden on our farm uh, you know, to live on. So subsistence farming refers to this idea of farmers that are totally independent, 
uh, and then they sell their excess at a profit. So just know what subsistence farming is. So that's it for this week. Everyone's doing a great job. Again, if you need to get in touch with me for any reason, if the website's not working, you have questions, you're having issues, uh, 419-345-7220 is my text. I love hearing from you all, and uh, have a safe week. I'll talk to you again next week. Thank you.